thank you all for joining us um, for our Marin Health first webinar of our series. Um, we will be discussing urinary incontinence. Um, the presentation today is going to be about 25 minutes, and then we'll have a short Q&A period at the end. If you already sent in your question um, ahead of time, then I have it. If you have new questions that come up, um, you are welcome to type them into the chat box, and we will address what we can at the end. Um, you can show that it will either show that you can type to all participants and then everyone will see it, or you can privately message it to all panelists, and then we'll see it and aim to address those at the end. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and hand it off to Dr. Robert Chan, who is a urologist at Marin Health Urology. He specializes in general urology, as well as urinary incontinence, voiding dysfunction, and pelvic organ prolapse. Um, and he has a great presentation for us today, and I will go ahead and hand it off to you, Dr. Chan. All right, thanks, Monica, and thanks everybody for showing up today. So um, let's go ahead and get started here. Um, the objectives for today. So there's two main topics that I was going to talk about. Uh, the first one was overactive bladder or that got to go sensation. And then the second main topic I was going to talk about is uh, stress urinary incontinence. So I bring up this picture of uh, Samuel L. Jackson um, just because it's He's a, he's a person that developed incontinence in his late 40s, and he wears incontinence devices while working on movie sets as well. Um, but I just kind of mentioned this to, to say that overactive bladder is a very common condition, and it's nothing to be embarrassed about. So we'll approach it kind of with a case. Um, you know, let's talk about a 70-year-old male who prevents presents for urinary incontinence. Some of the symptoms that he talks about are urinary frequency every hour with occasional urge incontinence requiring one to two pad use per day. And then at nighttime, he wakes up two to three times um, to go to the bathroom. So what is overactive bladder? I'm just gonna kind of talk about some of the definitions that you might hear in this presentation, uh, just that you're clear about what, what I'm talking about when I mention it. So urgency is that symptom of having to go to the bathroom really quickly. Um, urge incontinence is when you get urgency and then you have leakage of urine. Frequency is during the daytime. If you are finding yourself going to the bathroom more than eight times per day and it's bothersome, uh, then it's considered frequency. And then finally, nocturia is when you wake up more than one time per night to go to the bathroom. So in general, uh, women tend to have more overactive bladder uh, than men do. And what's interesting is that um, as people age, uh, it tends to become a little bit more common and prevalent. Now, the cause of overactive bladder isn't really quite understood for sure, but there's two main hypotheses of why. One is the neurogenic hypothesis, where they think that the nerves might be uh, a little off and lead to kind of the bladder being unstable. And then there's the myogenic hypothesis, where um, they think that the bladder muscle cells themselves are more likely to spontaneously contract. Now, whenever you come in to see um, me or one of my partners in the urology clinic, uh, this is kind of can, what you can expect in terms of a workup. Uh, usually, we'll get a good history, do a physical exam, and then check your urine. But then if it's more complicated um, patients, we have a bladder scanner to, to check how much urine is left after you urinate. Um, and we, we try to have you fill out this questionnaire um, just to get a baseline of kind of how bad your symptoms are. Um, it's called the urinary distress inventory, but it basically kind of assesses for um, these symptoms of frequent urination, um, leakage, um, and just trouble emptying your bladder. Now let's talk a little bit about um, the different treatment options. Uh, I'll break it down into like first line, second line, and third line therapy. Um, the first line therapy is basically stuff that you can do at home right now. You don't need like a like a doctor's uh, note or anything like that. 
Um, but it mostly involves like behavioral and lifestyle changes. And what that entails is changing the things that you eat or your activity level or how much you're drinking and putting into your body. And then training techniques, um, which is more just like physical therapy and, and Kegel type exercises. Now, in terms of uh, modifying what you put in your body, uh, one of the easiest things to cut out that will help is caffeine. Um, caffeine is a diuretic, which means it makes you make more urine, but it also um, makes your bladder more, um, more unstable. So reducing or eliminating, you know, caffeine, if, if you're drinking a lot of coffee, uh, can help. The other thing is um, stopping smoking. Um, it's been found that people who smoke tend to have a lot more urgency and frequency than those who don't. Uh, weight reduction. Um, this is another, you know, good benefit of, you know, trying to maintain more of a healthy lifestyle and, and healthier eating habits. Women who have a body mass index more than 30 uh, tend to have uh, more overactive bladder symptoms. And then losing weight actually will improve that urgent continence. And then finally, avoiding uh, constipation, um, especially in the elderly population, uh, working on the constipation can help with uh, improving symptoms of frequency and urgency. In terms of like the pelvic floor, um, some of the data basically suggests that getting any type of uh, pelvic floor therapy um, is a lot more effective than than doing nothing. We have a really great uh, pelvic floor therapist uh, with Marin Health, Zelda Orenstein. She uh, specializes in pelvic floor issues um, and and working with women um, on on that. So she's a really good resource, um, just so that you're aware of it. Now let's talk a little bit about second line therapy. Uh, there's two main classes, anti-muscarinics and then beta-3 adrenergic receptors. Usually, I'd say if, if you've seen a doctor about your overactive bladder, you've probably tried some of these medications already. Um, so I'm not going to go into too much detail. Uh, in terms of the anti-muscarinics, these have been around for decades. These have been around for a long time. A lot of these are actually generic drugs at this point. Um, there's different formulations. So some of them um, come in a patch that you can kind of just put on your skin. Um, it's, it's actually, you can actually buy this over the counter. It's called the Oxytrol patch. Uh, some of them are creams, and then most of them are just pills that you take. The main problems with these is a lot of patients complain of like dry mouth and constipation. And then one of the newer kind of side effects that we've kind of discovered in the past few years that is a little uh, concerning is that there is an association with um, delayed recall and um, other sort of mental uh, changes. Now that's to say that correlation is not causation, which means that these drugs don't cause you to get dementia, um, but, but they are kind of correlated with it. A lot of people who start on these medications from their physician um, stop taking it uh, because of side effects. And what we found is that only about 14% remain on therapy one year out. Um, in terms of the risk of dementia, they found that the more that you take of the anti-muscarinics tends to be more of a dose-dependent relationship. And then finally, uh, some words of caution about who should probably not be on these medications. Uh, anybody with glaucoma, people who have trouble emptying their stomach or have urinary retention, uh, these medications will probably exacerbate that. And then finally, frail elderly patients. One of the newer medications is something called Mirbetric. Uh, you've probably seen the commercials with uh, the little little bladder here leading somebody around. Now, this is a big improvement over the anti-muscarinics because it doesn't have the side effects of the dry mouth or constipation. Um, it doesn't have the, you know, the association with uh, dementia and cognitive uh, issues. 
the only side effect I have to kind of warn people about is that it increases your blood pressure a little bit um, in some patients, but nothing significant. And it's possible to take both the, uh, the mirbetric and the anti-muscarinics. Um, if, if one kind of works and, and the other kind of works, combining them together, you get a better advantage. Now, finally, what I want to kind of spend the, the focus of this presentation on, because I think this is the type of stuff that people probably haven't heard about as much, is uh, third-line therapy. So this is basically when people have tried two different type of medications and haven't seen the symptom relief that they were hoping for. So there's three main uh, types of things that we can do. Um, the first one is called percutaneous tibial nerve stimulation. And if anybody has had acupuncture before, it's very similar to that. We end up putting a small needle in the um, area this, where they have this little brown target here. Um, and then we hook it up to a small electrical device that stimulates this yellow nerve and will basically kind of reprogram your, your bladder so that it's not as overactive. The sessions are 30 minutes for once a week for about 12 weeks. And then if you have good benefit with it, then patients just stay on it for just once a month for maintenance sessions. There's no side effects to it, which is the great thing about this. Um, and then success rates are 60 to 81%. So here's just another picture of um, the needle and kind of how it relates to that tibial nerve and how it basically goes all the way back to the spine and, and, and then goes down to the bladder. Uh, the next is uh, Botox. This is like the same stuff that people inject in their face. Uh, the way it works is it basically kind of paralyzes the, the muscle for several months. Um, so the Botox can last for five to nine months. It's about 60% effective. Um, the main side effect that I always have to warn people about is that if it works too well, there's a 6% chance of urinary retention uh, where for during those five to nine months, you may not be able to urinate. And so, um, so patients just have to kind of be accepting that there is a very real possibility, um, however small, that they may end up getting a catheter for that duration. And then finally, uh, systemic dissemination um, with breathing problems tends to be rare. Uh, the Botox, when we put it into the bladder, will stay in the bladder and not spread elsewhere. So we do this procedure in our office. Uh, it's a quick, probably five minute procedure. Um, we use lidocaine to help numb up the bladder before we inject the Botox into, into the bladder. So this picture here is just a, a picture of the camera that you, we use, which is called a cystoscope. Um, and then these are kind of the injection sites uh, throughout the bladder. And then finally, the last uh, treatment modality is something called sacral neuromodulation. The easiest way to kind of think about this is that it's basically like a pacemaker for your bladder. And this lead here that goes down into the uh, S3 foramen um, it provides this electrical signal to kind of reprogram the, the nerves that go to the bladder. The nice thing about this is that it, the newest uh, generation, one of these will last for about 15 years and it's uh, rechargeable so that you only have to recharge it about every two weeks or uh, once a month. Uh, success rate is about 73% um, in terms of reducing the incontinence and 82% in reducing the number of pads. Um, the side effects are that you some people have some pain at the implant site. Um, and then in the old generation device, the battery only lasted for about four and a half years uh, before you had to go back in and replace it. Um, but with the newer ones, uh, it lasts for about 15 years now, which makes it a much, uh, you know, much more convenient um, process. And we do have to put these in the operating room. Um, just because it is a prosthetic, uh, we try to make it as sterile of an environment as possible. 
All right, next, I'm going to talk a little bit about stress urinary incontinence. Um, so this picture is um, the star of uh, Titanic. Uh, my six year old's been reading a lot of uh, Titanic books recently, and so we watched the movie. And so I was interested to find out that Kate Winslet has been, you know, very vocal about um, sharing her incontinence issues following the birth of her children. So we'll take a look at sort of an index patient again, uh, just to get a picture of, you know, kind of what does this type of patient look like? A uh, 44-year-old female who's had three children uh, who leaks with coughing, laughing, sneezing, and has to go through three or four pads per day. And in the past, um, she's had surgery and had her uterus removed. So there's different types of um, stress urinary incontinence. Uh, basically, the, the term means that you leak with exertion without your bladder contracting. Now contrast that with the urge urinary incontinence, which is leakage with urgency and your bladder contracting. And then you can actually unfortunately have both at the same time where um, you have both stress incontinence and urge incontinence. That's what we would call the mixed urinary incontinence. Um, so why do women have stress urinary incontinence? Sometimes it's from the loss of urethral support when women have like the vaginal delivery and the head comes through um, that canal, um, the, the ligaments that support the urethra end up unfortunately getting sometimes torn. So you lose that support. And then other times it's the, the sphincter itself is just weak. Uh, risk factors, as you would kind of uh, expect, pregnancy, obstructive trauma, aging, Caucasian, smoking, uh, lung disease like COPD, and then obesity. Um, so this is a little bit about what we do uh, in the office uh, to ask about the history. Um, and then the, the most important thing is that we always want to kind of demonstrate that, uh, that the patient is actually leaking. So sometimes we'll have them lay down and uh, cough and bear down. It's just basically to try to simulate um, the leakage. We'll always check a bladder scan as well, and then um, and then also uh, a urine culture just to make sure that there isn't something else like a urinary tract infection that might be causing a lot of these symptoms. Um, in terms of treatment options, uh, I'll touch on the conservative options and then some of the surgical options. So, the conservative things that you can do uh, this this is a pessary. Uh, it's basically like a little rubber donut that um, is placed in the vagina. Um, but this specific one is special because it has a little knob at the at the very top that can uh, kind of put some pressure on the urethra. Um, it's not it's not very effective, but uh, basically it's an option for people who who don't want to try some of the more invasive stuff. This next thing, the Impressa bladder support. You can find this at the uh, store um, and just kind of buy it um, without a prescription or anything. But it's kind of the same idea as the pessary. Uh, this thing goes into the vagina here and then expands to try to kind of put some pressure on the urethra um, so, that, uh, so that it doesn't leak as much. Now, these things you can't leave in there um, all day. Usually, you have to kind of change it out after after a while. Uh, there are certain medications that will increase outlet resistance, um, some tricyclic antidepressants like a mipramine, um, and then some serotonin agonists um, like duloxetine can help. And then also estrogens um, can, can help with kind of bulking up uh, some of the tissue down in the vagina. Next, we'll talk about some of the uh, surgical options. Uh, the first one is something called bulking agent. We go in and then inject some of the stuff right near the bladder neck, and it basically just, as the name says, bulks it up. Um, the downside is that this stuff doesn't stay around. Usually after about a year or two, uh, the body kind of reabsorbs it or 
um, it kind of dissipates and you have to kind of get it done again. And then finally, I'll, I'll touch on the mid-urethral sling. Uh, this is kind of what we consider the gold standard for stress urinary incontinence, but it basically acts like a hammock for underneath where your urethra is and gives it like some strong support so that whenever, whenever somebody bears down or coughs, uh, there's something rigid to kind of compress the urethra so that it kind of closes up. This is a pretty quick surgical procedure. It usually only takes about 10 or 15 minutes um, in, the, in the surgery setting. Um, and the recovery is fairly quick as well. The incision itself for this is only about basically one and a half centimeters. So it's really small. Um, and, and in general, it works 90, 95% of the time. And so one thing that I, wa I want to kind of touch on, um, you know, because I'm sure that you've probably maybe seen some of the lawsuit commercials on uh, television uh, about like transvaginal mesh. Um, so I just want to kind of clarify that this does not apply to mesh that's used for um, stress incontinence. This is more mesh that is being used for pelvic organ prolapse, like um, the bladder or like the uh, uterus or uh, cervix kind of falling out. And so um, the, the mesh for the stress incontinence, uh, there is, you know, it's FDA approved. Um, they haven't halted the sale of it for that. And so um, it's very different. And then that's pretty much it. So um, I know there were a few questions that people had, had uh, sent in earlier, um, but if anybody else has any other questions, i um, happy, to, happy to, to answer them. So one of our questions was um, regarding pelvic floor and abdominal exercises and how much of an improvement can you expect to see through those? Yeah. Um, so, uh, it, I mean, it really depends on the severity, I would say, um, of, here, let me, let me turn off the sharing here. Like, if it's for, more for, like, the stress incontinence, it, it's pretty effective. Um, I know they did a big meta-analysis uh, a few years back, but 56% was what they found um, with the stress incontinence that it could improve it. And then if it's urge incontinence, it, you know, pelvic floor is probably not as effective at, at that, but still, you know, 35% of patients um, had improvement with it, so. Great. Um, what about intermittent urinary incontinence um, treatments and exercises? Yeah. So uh, for intermittent incontinence, where it's not too uh, significant, like if it's an issue with like intermittently that people are having like leakage when they exercise, but only certain times. I mean, I would say the same thing with like Kegel exercises and pelvic floor therapy is helpful for that. Um, usually the way that I kind of counsel my patients on, you know, like whether they need like surgery for it or whether something like just pelvic floor exercises is enough is kind of based on like how much they're, they're going leaking and how much they're, you know, how many pads they're going through. So for instance, if somebody tells me they're going through like two, three or four pads a day. Um, then I'd, I'd probably be fairly inclined to kind of recommend doing like a sling initially. But if it's someone who just has like intermittent like leakage um, and it's not that severe, you know, usually I try to tend to be a little bit more conservative and recommend um, doing like uh, the pelvic floor exercises. Um, we had another question about bladder pain occurring at age 65 or later, um, what, what are some of the causes of that and what can you do to prevent bladder pain? Yeah, um, good question. 
Um, so common causes of bladder pain can be, you know, urinary tract infection is usually the first thing that we always kind of think of. Um, checking a urinary urine culture is, is helpful. Um, I've had some patients who, you know, they've had a lot of like negative urine cultures, but still have a lot of bladder pain. And so one of the things that I've started doing is there's this uh, next generation DNA sequencing test that I do that's able to pick up uh, bacteria that some of the traditional urine cultures don't pick up. Um, so, so I, I try to treat infections first. If that doesn't help, then, you know, there's this clinical entity called like interstitial cystitis that is associated with bladder pain. And there's certain things that kind of cause the bladder pain and interstitial cystitis to get, get worse. For instance, um, anything that you think might irritate your like eye, if you stuck it in your eye, um, is something that probably irritates your bladder. For so like spicy foods, or like citrus, or alcohol, all those things can kind of exacerbate bladder pain. So what I what I try to have patients do is uh, eliminate certain things from their diet and see if it see if it improves it. I mean, there are medications um, to help with uh, bladder pain. Um, they're, they're unfortunately not the most effective and, and some of them have sort of significant side effects. Um, but, but if basically the, you know, just changing the diet um, and sort of the triggers, removing the triggers from the diet aren't enough, then, then, then we kind of move on to those. Right. Um, we have two more questions, a little bit going into some other topics. So sure. if you're hopefully that's OK. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah that's whatever, so um, at what age and how often should men be tested for prostate cancer? Yeah, um, so the, the current guidelines are. To start testing at age 55. And then um, you can stop testing at age 69 unless you know there's a history of longevity so uh it's usually once a year that we test it um now if somebody has like a really like strong family history of uh prostate cancer in their family or if um you know if they're of african american descent uh we'll we'll start testing a little bit earlier at around age 45 just because there's a higher risk in in those populations Thanks. And last question that was submitted. Um, again, if anyone else wants to submit final questions, please do so in that chat box. Um, but our last one that we have is, um, is a mildly elevated creatinine level a cause for concern? Yeah. Um, so, so the creatinine can be, can be high for a couple of reasons. If it's a matter of just not being hydrated enough and like not drinking enough fluids at the time that you had your that you had your um, creatinine level checked, then then that can be something that can be rechecked and you know after like drinking enough like water. Um, now, if it doesn't go down and it's still slightly elevated, you know I think it's helpful to always just do something like a kidney ultrasound just to make sure there's not like some anatomical reason why um, the kidney function's not that great. Like just to make sure there's nothing blocking like one of the kidneys, like a kidney stone or something. Um, but overall, I mean, if it's just slightly elevated, I mean, most of the time it's not gonna like, you know, it's not gonna lead to, you know, you end up needing to kind of be on dialysis or anything. Um, but it's just important to kind of prevent it from getting like worse. Uh, for instance, if you have like diabetes, um, making sure that's under control, or if you have like high blood pressure, like making sure that's under control, because those things can kind of worsen um, kidney function over time. So, all right. Well, it looks like that is our time for today. Thank you so much everyone we actually sorry we do have one more question dr chan if you have if you have a second yeah, yeah definitely um what else is involved 
or if there is anything else involved in pelvic floor physical therapy beyond uh, Kegel exercises? Um, I, I think usually they have some element of like biofeedback. Um, and, and I'm not an expert in this by any means. Um, I would, I would probably, you know, recommend like just checking in with the, with the actual like pelvic floor therapist. But yeah, I mean, I think a lot of times the problem with the Kegels is like people don't actually know what the right muscles they're contracting. They're just kind of contracting some muscles down there and, and, and kind of guessing. And so the pelvic floor physical therapist has some equipment that they can kind of use to monitor and make sure that, that you're contracting the right muscles and doing it correctly. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Chan, for your time. And thank you to all of our attendees for listening in. Uh, we have recorded this and we'll be sharing it out on social um, so we can um, share it with others. All right. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thanks, Monica. Thanks, everyone, for attending.